So thanks everyone. So we're going to talk today about just doing a general Lepidopter survey and some of the different collecting methods you might use. So one of the purposes of this workshop was of course to familiarize you with Tuta Absoluta and some other MAWs in just terms of general dissections and how you would identify a moth using a dissection. But uh, we also want you to go back to your respective countries and do some collecting if possible and some surveying for Lepidoptera. And we're going to go through a variety of methods by which you can do that. Um, you can collect Lepidoptera very easily. Uh, there's not a whole lot of uh, required equipment or preparation. Moths come to light. A lot of you know that already. And so you can use uh, general light traps or just a sheet with a light and I'll show you all of these things. We of course also have pheromones. Uh, we can get you specific pheromones for a specific species like Tuta absoluta. And those can be, um, again, traps you can just put up and sort of forget about for a couple of weeks and go back to them later and see what you caught. Um, you can also bait for moths using just uh, form fermented fruit and things like that. Of course, you're all familiar with the butterfly net. You can go around and collect moths and uh, um, other Lepidopter that way. And then you can rear things that you find um, as larvae and maybe uh, as in mature stages and see, see what they come turn out to be. So black lighting is one of the ways that people collect moths quite commonly. Um, moths are attracted to most lights, not necessarily these new LED lights, but the uh, older incandescent lights. And then the more UV the light outputs, the more attractive it seems to be to most moths. And so we use black lights, either white black lights or black black lights. And also uh, things like mercury vapor lights, which are you know on the side of buildings a lot for security purposes. Those are also really good for attracting moths. Uh, you, the advantage of using some of these lights that are smaller is that you can run them off car batteries, 12 volt car batteries or just smaller batteries like that. A lot of the larger lights, you need to have a generator to actually produce AC to be able to run the light. And so this is just what a standard collecting setup might look like. This is, I believe, um, on Mount Kenya in uh, Africa. There is a sheet there. The white thing is just a sheet um, with a UV black light on the one side, the side that you can't see. And then the side that you can see here is a, this mercury vapor light on this pole right here. And so just any sort of um, white reflective surface that you put the light on attracts moths better because it, it, it accentuates the light. And so a uh, white sheet or the white side of a building or, or anything like that is ideal for collecting moths. This is what you can get in, uh, in an, one night. This is a famous picture from a, a collecting location in southern Arizona here in the U.S. Um, each of these are Saturnids. If you remember from our presentation a few days ago, these are pretty big moths. So um, there's a lot of moths on this sheet here. Uh, so this is just an example of what you can get. And certainly in the tropics, you can get um, collections in one night that looks like this. So this will keep you busy for quite a while if you needed to collect and, and spread and identify all of these. If you're looking to collect moths off a sheet or a side of a building or that have just come to a light at your house or however you find them, there's a couple of different ways of doing that as well. And so you can use a specific killing jar, meaning that it's a jar with some sort of killing agent in it that would kill the moth um, pretty instantly. The other method for doing this is to basically get some different size vials. I just have some pictures down here, just a stock picture of vi plastic vials with a plastic cap. And you can actually just keep the moth in the vial um, in a cool location or if you don't have access to a killing jar or don't want to deal with that, you can actually just put them in a freezer. And that works quite well. It kills them and also keeps them preserved for uh, spreading or mounting or putting a pin through them later on when you want to actually add them to your collection. 
The other method of using a light to collect moths is in a, a trap of some sort. Um, we use bucket traps that are, as, as the name suggests, simply a bucket with some sort of light above it here. Um, the bucket usually consists of a light, a funnel into which the moths fall um, in a rainy environment like in in the tropics, you would want to have some sort of holes in the bottom of the bucket so the rain could drain out because it's usually going to rain um, quite often. You would probably have a killing agent in the bucket so that the moths would die fairly shortly after falling through the funnel and then some sort of power source to run the light. And these again are really simple. You can put them out overnight and come back in the morning and see what you caught. Um, these are some commercial examples. Uh, they actually cost quite a bit of money, but you can make your own. I use my own traps that I've made for not very much money. This is basically just a simple bucket. Here's the funnel, here's the light. The moths come in, they fall into the bucket, they die, and then you collect them the next morning. When you're looking to collect moths, uh, this is more for endemic species, uh, not necessarily pests. Um, pest species, of course, you're looking in probably agricultural areas and so, uh, or disturbed areas. So you have a little more um, leeway there as far as where you would put your traps. If you're actually looking to trap out in the forest or in uh, some natural area, you want to place the trap carefully so that you get as much light distribution as possible. So you can put a trap in the middle of a very dense rainforest and not really catch much because the moths don't actually see the light because it's obscured by the plants. Um, we generally try to trap along edges and that's a, that's a good um, way to remember that a lot of the diversity that you see um, in the landscape is along different edges of things. So if you have a forest going into a grassland or a forest going into a field, that's an area that would be potentially higher in diversity because you'd be ca capturing species from the forest in addition to the, the other area. This can also include ridgeline streams, high points like I have written here. Um, we try to avoid putting things low in the environment because you often get cold air pockets or inversions in these sort of low areas like next to a stream at the very bottom of a hill. Might not be a really good area where you, if you could move up the hill a little ways. Lights only attract moths from a fairly short distance away. So again, in order to get the most number of moths, you want to have the light as visible as possible. And using these traps is good, be, but you have to remember that they don't catch all the moths. A lot of them fly in and sit next to the trap and then fly away in the morning. And so the traps are not completely efficient. And this applies to pheromone traps as well. Although they're a little bit more efficient because they're more specific um, for the moth that you're trying to attract. Here's some examples of uh, just a bucket trap of what you might catch in there. Here's a, a trap with, uh, these are, the bags are actually ammonium, so they're a killing agent. Um, here's a deadhead sphinx on, on the top of the funnel here um, that came in that night. Here's an example of just putting some, uh, these are egg cartons actually in the bottom of the trap to keep beetles from destroying everything. So this is an elephant dung beetle. These, this trap was from Kenya as well. Um, and this thing got in the trap and if we didn't have these egg cartons in here, it would run around and just basically destroy everything. And so if you trapping in a location with a lot of beetles and you're actually looking for moths and not beetles, you might want to put some, uh, some dividers in the bottom of the trap. In this case, again, these are just egg cartons and it works quite well just to keep things in place when they fall into the trap. Another way of trapping moths that is more specific is pheromone, using pheromones, um, synthetic pheromones have been produced for all the important economic lepidopteran pests. Uh, the most common groups here I have listed include the, the cecids, so these are wood borers, tortricids, um, something like a gypsy moth, tuta, uh, of course, we have old wool bullworm, uh, Helica verpa, spidoptera, chrysodexes, all of these really common um, tropical pests, we have, we have pheromones available. 
the specificity or what the pheromone actually attracts is different for a lot of these taxa. The Tuda pheromone is actually quite specific in that you don't necessarily get a whole lot of other small Gelichiids that would be easily confused with Tuda in these traps. Um, you do get some other things like these, these other tomato pinworms and that that we've been discussing over the last few days. Uh, but in general, the pheromone is pretty good in comparison to uh, some of the other pheromones that attract a lot of non-targets. So if you use a helicoverpa trap, and we did some helicoverpa training in, in Trinidad a couple years ago, you'll encounter a lot of non-targets that look just like this, the moth that you're trying to capture. And so it's a lot of work to go through those traps. But with Tuda, it's not, it's not actually that bad. There's a few different types of pheromone traps that you can use. Uh, the one on the left here is called a wing trap. This would be a sticky bottom. So the moths will come in and be stuck. And uh, you will come then a couple weeks later and collect them probably. The one in the middle here is just called a moth catcher or bucket trap. This is more similar to the, the bucket light traps, but you would put the pheromone in the top here. The moths will come in and fall into this funnel and then they would be trapped down here and there's probably a killing agent down on the bottom that would kill them. And then a delta trap, and there's a different varieties of this, Jackson traps, delta traps, etc. cetera. Um, the moths come in the end here, again, there's a sticky bottom and they get stuck and then eventually die and you can come collect them. Generally for micro moths, and in other words, for moths that are like two to size or smaller, um, you would use some sort of sticky trap like the wing trap or delta trap or Jackson trap. These traps are not great for using uh, to collect larger moths like noctuids. And so for noctuids, you would probably wanna use something like the moth catcher trap or the bucket trap where you would ha don't have to rely on the moth being stuck to the, the sticky surface because the larger moths are powerful enough that they can actually flap off of the sticky surface and escape. This is what one of the uh, inserts of what the delta trap, you can just pull this out and, and pull the insert out and put a new insert in when you're servicing the trap. Um, again, these are a sticky board and you can see that there's a variety of, in this case, tortuous is stuck to this one. You have to be somewhat careful in handling sticky traps. There's two types of sticky traps out there now. There's the old fashioned stickum trap which is really quite messy if you get it on your hands or your clothes or your lab equipment, it doesn't really come off very easily. And that's the type of trap where you're using uh, something like Histoclear to remove the moths. There's some newer sticky traps out there that are low tack and you can actually touch them with your hands and not get the stickiness on your hands. Um, those are a lot easier to service, but they're also uh, a lot more expensive. And they maybe don't work quite as well because the sticky surface isn't quite as sticky as the old type of traps. And so uh, sometimes people don't use those in surveys because they're worried that they're not quite as efficient. Um, but in any sort of sticky trap, when you're servicing the trap, you want to, uh, if you're taking the entire trap down, in this case, this is a trap that doesn't have a removable insert. So in the uh, first picture here, they're taking the trap down, looking at the contents of the trap. And if you're going to store the trap or ship it somewhere, you want to make sure that you don't stick the two halves together. This happens quite a bit where somebody just takes a trap down and smashes it over here. And those two halves are then stuck together permanently. And when you pull them apart, you destroy all of the moths on the trap. And so we use this picture to show people how to actually handle and store and ship sticky traps. And in this case, we're putting a few packing peanuts in, in between the two halves of the trap. So when they're folded over, for storage or shipment, they're not stuck together and destroying all the specimens. You can also take sticky trap specimens and using a some sort of a razor blade or razor knife, just cut them off the trap. In this case, um, this is how we used to handle um, moth surveys in California quite a bit. We would just take them off and cut out this square. You can see it's about two millimeters square with these three moths on it and then put it into a, 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 a jar like this. And, and that's the uh, easiest way to actually um, store moths from sticky traps without actually having to remove them from the, the trap itself. You, some people also just cut these out and put a pin through them and put them in the collection. 
that's not ideal because they can be stuck to other things later on. Um, but this sort of storage is fine. And I, and I had this lecture from a few days ago, so I think you already learned how to remove the moss from sticky traps. If we're not using specific traps, uh, you might see if you're hiking through the forest that moths and butterflies and other lepidopter will come to uh, puddles or animal dung or fruit that's that's sitting in the forest along the path or something along those lines. And so many species aren't actually attracted to light. And so the light traps that I showed you earlier in the presentation might not attract um, some of these species. But you can attract different types of moths and other species and different sexes of moths using some just very simple rotting fruit bait, essentially. Um, people get really fancy with the type of bait that they try to make. Uh, in general, though, if you just use some sort of sugar, yeast, um, and rotting fruit, and maybe pour an old expired can of beer over it or something like that, it works quite well. And uh, especially in, in tropical areas, you'll get a lot of butterflies, especially, but also some larger moths like noctuids, um, eurebids, will come into these sort of traps. And um, you can collect things like fruit piercing moths and that that you normally wouldn't find using some of these other methods uh, using a trap like this. This is just an example of what some of these traps look like or, or some of the baiting looks like. And here's an actual bait trap. Um, so this is just smearing some of the uh, the sugar bait on the side of a tree and here's a moth that will come to that. Here's an example of an actual bait trap where you actually have a cylinder of cloth or mesh of some sort and this just it's just a wooden base and there's just a pie pan here with the bait on it and so the the moths or butterflies come in they come up here and they feed on the bait and then they always fly up so they generally never fly down or never crawl down if you disturb a moth or butterfly, they usually always fly up. And so you can see all the moths and butterflies that have been collected in this trap up here. You can also just go around and collect uh, Lepidopter, including moths, uh, using a, a, just a, a butterfly net, as you've probably seen before. Um, a lot of different moths actually don't come to light at all. And so this is an example down here of a tortricid. Here he is sitting on a leaf. Um, this is a fairly small moth, probably a couple centimeters across. And you can see his long antennae here. And we actually rediscovered this moth uh, back in 2009. It had been, we thought, extinct for 100 years. Um, but that was because it doesn't come to light. And so you can put a black light right next to this, this location where this moth was photographed, and you would never find it. You have to go there during the day with a net and actually find the moths flying up from the vegetation and collect them that way. And so you can learn a lot um, visiting a, a location with a butterfly net during the day. And that includes a, a field or a location where you're surveying for pests because you might find things that you normally wouldn't find in, in these different types of traps I've been showing you. You can also, of course, rear out any sort of immatures that you find. Um, this includes, of course, eggs, larvae, and pupae. It's usually easier to rear out larger stages. In other words, if you start out with eggs, you might have a difficulty getting them all the way through to the adult stage. But if you find a, an apple with a, a caterpillar inside of it, um, it's usually pretty easy to rear this out to see what sort of, in this case, tortricid that would be. Um, you can also find larvae like this uh, sphingia down here in the, in the bottom right that's been parasitized. So these are actually little, um, Hymenoptera cocoons on the uh, on the larvae, so this is not going to um, uh, develop into an adult. But you can still use, you know, you can still identify this larva potentially. Um, a lot of the pest species that we encounter have larvae that look very similar to each other and to other non-pest species. So specifically, the tortricids and a lot of the noctuids and uh, some of the pyralids as well, you have, it's very difficult to actually identify the larvae to species without using 
DNA sequencing. And so that's what I'll show you at the, uh, the next presentation is how we actually would do that um, using some DNA. Microlepidoptera can be especially easy to rear. These are some plastic containers down here with avocados in them. And these are rearing out some avocado pests. And so if you found an avocado with a hole in it with some obvious larval damage, it might be quite easy just to take it and put it in a box and um, you know the moth would eventually emerge from the avocado and you could identify it that way. It is generally much easier to um, identify uh, pest species that are adults versus larvae for the reasons that I just stated because uh, you actually end up with a lot of larvae that look exactly like the non-targets that, that are in the same family or even, even some other things that just look similar. And so usually having adults is easier to identify than, than having larvae. And so rearing them out in this method is, is a good way to go if you find some pests that you don't know what they are. There are a variety of killing agents that you might use to um, kill as it says, the moths that you're collecting off of a trap or from a butterfly net, or just that you find on the side of your house. Um, a lot of these you can see are pretty hazardous in uh, cyanide. It was commonly used in the past. It's not used very commonly anymore because of course it's difficult to get and it's extremely dangerous. Ethyl acetate is um, another killing agent that is a lot more commonly used in traps. And uh, this is just fingernail polish remover, so it's not nearly as hazardous as something like cyanide. It's also fairly readily available, and so a lot of people use ethyl acetate in, in traps. Um, ammonia is another option. I use a solid ammonia called ammonium carbonate, which might be more difficult to get for some people. Um, but you can also use liquid ammonia. Uh, this is also quite hazardous if it's, if it's high concentrated ammonia. And so I would recommend for most people who are just general collectors of moths and pests that they encounter, just put them in the freezer. So freezing is always a safe alternative. If you have access to a freezer, you can actually take the moth, put it in the freezer, it will die. Uh, fairly rapidly. And it's also then preserved there for you can take it out later and and and, and spread it and mount it and uh, put it in your collection later on and so you don't need to deal with it right away. If you kill a moth using one of these other methods, um, including ethyl acetate or, or ammonia in a, in a bucket trap, you have to process those fairly rapidly and you might need to actually uh, relax them in order to to pin them, even to put a pin through the thorax. And so uh, you would basically take a plastic container with some uh, wet paper towels in it and put the moth or your trap collection from the night before into, into that container. And, and the, the moisture from the paper towels and that will, will rehydrate the moth to the point where you can put pins through them. Um, and Juliet had a great idea here about talking a little bit more about that, which I'll do here if I have some time at the end. Um, this is just an example of some of the killing agents. Again, cyanide is way too dangerous. I don't recommend using that for anything. Ethyl acetate is fingernail polish remover. It comes in liquid form. It's pretty easy to use. Concentrated ammonia, I think, is probably also pretty hazardous. I would recommend using ethyl acetate. You can put it in some sort of, these are commercial killing jars down here in the bottom um, from BioQuip. You can also take a canister like this with a little wick on it and, and fill this with ethyl acetate in order to use it in your traps. When no other killing agent is available, again, a freezer is always a good option. Microlepidoptera dehydrate fairly quickly in a freezer and might need to be relaxed more than other things to uh, be spread. But um, my macrolepidoptera, in, in other words, noctuas, pyralids, um, even larger pyralids, and anything bigger than that can be usually put in a freezer and stored for months or even years and then 
thawed out and spread without having to do anything else. So this is a really good method for storing moss for, for prepare, preparation later. And again, here's some examples of just some plastic vials. So you could just put them off in the vial, put it in the freezer and just leave it there for, and you can come back weeks or months later and, and, and spread it and put it in your collection. Keep in mind though that you always wanna have data associated with your specimens. I think Jim talked a lot about that a couple of days ago. And so you don't wanna just put a moth in the vial and then put it in the freezer and then forget where it came from. You wanna put a label in there in some way to identify what that was, where it came from and uh, all the associated data. Pinning and spreading moths is fairly difficult, especially if they're small. These are all micros. This is from a couple weeks of collecting in Australia. Um, so we don't have time to go into that. Uh, but as you saw from uh, some earlier presentations, you don't actually need to get this fancy with a lot of these smaller moths. You can put them in gelatin capsules and they'll work just fine. Um, for later dissection or sequencing. And um, I think we mentioned this earlier too, that sequencing might work better for moths that are not relaxed. And so if you don't have to put them in some sort of um, relaxing uh, chamber with water, it's probably better for sequencing because uh, water breaks down DNA in all instances. So if you have specimens that have not been um, in a moist environment, it's a lot better for sequencing if, if later on you need to do that. So labeling specimens, collection data is as important as the specimen itself. Having an unlabeled specimen um, is almost useless scientifically. Using uh, some format for the labels is important as long as you're consistent and you can you know, interpret the data on the label. It doesn't really matter a whole lot in terms of uh, how fancy you get here, as long as you have some sort of data associated with the specimen. And that would generally be the country and municipality of some sort and the location and probably GPS coordinates. Uh, most modern collections require some sort of GPS coordinates. You also might require to have GPS coordinates in order to submit specimens for official DNA barcode records. And so that's important. Um, that also can get you back, of course, to the very specific location where you collected the, the specimen. And so if you don't have any other, any other collection location information, having the GPA coordinates might be enough. The elevation is also quite useful in terms of if you find, uh, if you find, um, you know, a moth at the very bottom of the mountain versus the very top of the mountain, even though they look very similar, they might be different species and that might be easy to discern based on the elevation where they were actually collected. Um, and then the method of collecting, some people put that on there in terms of if it was by UV light or during the day or with a net or something like that, somewhat less important, but having as much information as you can have associated with the specimen is probably good. Um, printing them small is, is usually desirable because a lot of people with collections don't want to take up a lot of space with labels. And so having some sort of small font is usually four point or something along those lines is probably standard. And then using some sort of archival paper. Um, and so not just standard copy paper, but if you have some, some higher rag content paper, it's probably good. And usually laser printers are better than sort of inkjet printers. You can also, of course, just write labels using a, a permanent pen of some sort or even a pencil um, because those are more permanent than something like an inkjet where the letters can actually fall off the paper later on. Uh, back to the presentation here. So here's some, just some examples of some, some labels that you might find it in my collection, for instance. And again, having the GPS coordinates is really useful. We've got GPS coordinates, the country location, G GPS coordinates, date, and then here's the elevation. And so all of that's really useful information to have associated with the specimen. Um, storing specimens is sort of up to the resources that you have available. The most important thing is to keep them sealed in some container of some sort to avoid damage by other insects, especially domestids. 
Um, in the tropics in the Caribbean region, though, you might have dermestids and silverfish and ants. Ants is a big problem. Um, and so having some sort of drawers or sealed wooden boxes with tight fitting lids is usually ideal for keeping out these sorts of things. Um, we used to, in most major collections, put in some sort of killing agent for these pests into the collection. And that would be with some sort of mothballs or naphthalene um, or paradichlorobenzene or vapona or some things like that. We've since learned that a lot of those things are actually, um, actually cause cancer. And so that's not good. And so short of just some standard mothballs that are just naphthalene, which seems to be probably the safest of those different options. What you can do is rotate your collection drawers or boxes through a freezer um, to actually kill off these other domestics and things like that. And so a lot of the major collections now will rotate their collections through a freezing, a freezing um, uh, cycle. And so you end up at least once a year freezing everything in the collection uh, and killing off these domestics and and silverfish and book lice and things like that. Um, it's more important probably just to keep a uh, keep an eye on the collection um, and just don't put it away. Don't put it, don't put a box of moths on a shelf and forget about them for a couple of years, because you're likely to, likely to come back and find that they've been destroyed by dermestids. Um, so just keeping an eye on the collection is really the most important thing. And if you notice there's some sort of damage, you can put them in a freezer and, and take care of that. Um, storing specimens in a cool, dry place is important if you're going to do some sort of DNA work later on. Um, this is difficult in humid areas in, in, in the eastern U.S. and then, of course, in the Caribbean and more tropical areas. Because it is so humid constantly, it destroys the DNA quite rapidly. So keeping the specimens in a cool, dry place is uh, especially important in, in areas like that if you plan on doing some sort of DNA work. Um, even specimens from Florida, and that I, I can tell that we don't get as high quality DNA extractions from those as we might from specimens collected here in Colorado where the humidity is really low the entire year. Um, but a lot of this is really um, dependent on where, of course, where you live and what resources you have available. As I said before, it's important to curate or examine the collection regularly. Um, it's of course important to label the specimens as you obtain them and so you don't forget where they came from. And if you just notice some domestic damage or don't notice it even better, but if you notice some, you can, you can deal with it and take care of it versus just putting these things away and never looking at them again, in which case they're probably gonna be destroyed. And so, Collection organization, again, is a personal preference and whatever you have access to. But even a small reference collection can help greatly with common identification issues. And you've probably noticed that with um, in your work if, you're, if you are identifying insects, that just having a, a small reference collection of these different pest species, having a tuta and a, an old world bullworm and a spodoptera and, you know, and some of these other different species, um, in your collection there. So when you run into these um, to be identified, you can reference the specimens that you have and compare those and see um, what the IDs might be. A lot easier than starting from scratch each time. And so this is just the famous uh, picture of the Smithsonian collection here. This is in the, the Lepidoptera section here. Um, just showing you what, you know, this is sort of one of the best collections of the world looks like. We don't, of course, expect anyone to keep a collection like this. Um, but we sort of go from this down to a few drawers of insects, if you have access to that. And if you don't have access to um, the, the space or the, the equipment for that, you know, you can just have a simple box like this. In this case, there's some butterflies in it, but you could just have your, you know, your insect, your lepidopteran pests in this, in this one box and just, uh, this is a fairly well sealed box and so pests wouldn't be easily able to get in there and you could just use that as your reference. So there's a variety of different collection um, levels you can get to here, but even just having a simple box of, of moths is, is really quite helpful. So I wanted to go to a couple comments here that people made during this, uh, during this presentation is uh, in terms of preserving 
caterpillars in terms of preserving larvae. And so if you go back to what I had talked about, rearing things from immature stages, if you can rear them out to adult stage, that's great because those are usually easier to identify. But if they die or they're parasitized, like this one down here in the bottom, or you just simply don't have time to do that, you can preserve the larvae and you can we, you know, we can identify larvae using different characters of the larva, different um, seed oil arrangements and things like that. And the best way to do that is for um, morphological work is to put the larva into 70% ethanol. That's the best way to preserve larvae for morphological work later on. We sort of have a dilemma in that people that want to do sequencing for larvae um, and they put them in 70% ethanol, it's not great for preserving the DNA. And so if you plan on actually sequencing the larva, you wanna put it into uh, some sort of higher percentage alcohol, something like 95%. The problem with that is a lot of, like if I put this little pink tortritid into 95% ethanol, it would turn black almost instantly. And so it really um, is quite difficult to identify larval specimens um, that are put in high percentage ethanol because they do discolor so so badly. Um, but in order for those to be used for sequencing, that's the best way to preserve them. So you really have to think about what you want to do with the larva in terms of how you would preserve it. But generally, people preserve larvae in 70% ethanol, and you can keep it in there forever. That would be it's just where it would stay um, for your larval collection. So you can have different vials of larvae. Um, that have been identified in 70% ethanol that you can use for a reference collection as well. And then Jim wanted to point out that ammonium carbonate um, is uh, Baker's ammonia. Um, I actually, I think, published the first paper on using ammonium carbonate as a killing agent back in the late 80s. Um, but it's readily available in baking stores and that because it's used in baking bread as a leavening agent that you would use when you're baking bread. Um, you can find it in different areas of the world. Um, I've purchased it in Africa and Europe um, and different places like that. Jim said here that they found it in Puerto Rico, um, or no, they, they bought some online and used it in Puerto Rico, which I've done that as well too. Um, it does uh, degrade in humidity quite rapidly. And so that is one disadvantage of using something like ammonium carbonate in, uh, in the tropics. Um, but it is a safe alternative. It's used in baking bread. And so it's something that's you know, much safer than any of these other uh, killing methods. But again, if you have a freezer available, that might be, um, that might be just as good for, for your purposes. So I think that's the end of the collecting presentation. Does anybody have any questions before I get into the molecular diagnostics overview? Yeah, uh, I just wanted to add that. Um, I believe when you were talking about the use of the various chemicals in the display cases, for example, to keep out uh, or to kill beetles and so forth, um, you mentioned about using mothballs. I believe uh, the naphthalene in mothballs is now deemed carcinogenic, so we can't use them either. Okay, yeah, yeah. I think pretty much all of the killing agents that have been um, used in the past, PDB and naphthalene and vapona, have all been now designated as, as cancer agents. I think naphthalene was maybe the safest of those, but again, yeah, we, most of all the major collections in the world at this point have eliminated these, these uh, fumigant agents in their collections. And most uh, everywhere has just gone to using freezers or something like that to keep the number of pests down. It's more difficult to deal with that in the tropics though, because a lot of these collections like professional collections, like at museums and that will keep the collection rooms really cold and they'll keep low humidity and they'll, they'll be a lot easier to control the climate. Um, so yeah, that's a, that's a good point. But I think any of the fumigant agents at this point, if you can avoid using them, it is a good thing. So thanks for that. Does anybody have any other questions? Yes, do you use the freezing method with the larvae as well? 
Um, if you put the larvae into ethanol, they'll die instantly. You don't need to freeze them. You can freeze larvae if you don't have another method of preserving them at that time and then put them into ethanol or something later for preservation. Um, so yeah, you, you could do that if you, if you needed to. If you found a larva and you don't have, you don't want to rear it out for whatever reason and you want to preserve it for later and you don't have anything else available, you could put it in the freezer and then take it out later and put it in ethanol and that, that would probably be fine. Any other questions? Thanks, Todd. That was really excellent. We really appreciate that. Of course, we're looking forward to the molecular diagnostics as well and really good questions. Thank you so much. Well, I'll start on the molecular diagnostics. I'm going to attempt to be here for the whole session today. So if you run into collect questions about collecting or any, any of that later, we can answer those. And of course, Jim and and Julieta and others can answer those as well. So uh, this intro to molecular diagnostic is gonna be fairly brief because we could of course have an entire week or two weeks or a month session on this um, because there are so many things involved and so many new technologies and uh, the field of DNA diagnostics is changing constantly because of newer technologies. But I'm going to talk about just the basics today to get you an idea of just basic DNA diagnostics and how you would actually identify something using a DNA sequence. And so just as a review of what DNA is, um, if you haven't had biology class for a long time, you might not remember some of this, so we'll go over it just really quickly. So deoxyribonucleic acid, of course, is what DNA stands for. Um, I just cut and pasted a couple of the real simple, you know, um, examples of what, you know, what DNA actually does here. So it contains the biological instructions that make each species unique, or it's the complex molecule that contains all the information necessary to build and maintain an organism. As you know, um, everything usually happens, um, you know, DNA is basically our, our genetic code and that codes for RNA and that codes for proteins and that's what basically makes life happen. And so DNA is passed from the adult organisms to their offspring through re reproduction, as you know, I'm sure. And we have two types of DNA in animals, uh, nuclear DNA in the cell's nucleus and the mitochondrial DNA in the mitochondria. There's a reason there's different sets of DNA there, and I won't go into that, but um, basically there's two types of DNA in animals. You, you would end up with something like three types of DNA and plants or some other organisms where you'd have a chloroplast genome as well. Um, but with anim animals, we have these two types, more or less. And an organism's complete set of DNA, in this case, complete set of nuclear DNA would be called its genome. So if you hear about a complete genome sequence or something like that, that's what they're referring to. So really, again, real basic, in sexual reproduction, organisms inherit half their nuclear DNA from the male and the other half from the female. Um, but something to keep in mind is that mitochondrial DNA is only inherited from the female parent. So the sperm actually lose their mitochondria um, when they're actually fertilizing the egg. And so you don't end up with any mitochondrial DNA from the male parent. DNA is made from chemical building blocks called nucleotides. And the, the entire point in the process here is that DNA uh, makes RNA through transcription, and then we use RNA to make proteins through translation. And that's actually what builds, uh, you know, makes life happen. So we're gonna look real quickly at these chemical building blocks called nucleotides and see how we can actually use those in identification purposes. So we have four types of nucleotides within DNA. You know, the, the basic structure of DNA here is on the left and the double helix. And on the right here is just a really simple diagram of how these things are linked together. But we basically have these four bases, cytosine, guanine, adenine, and thymine. They're abbreviated C, G, A, and T, and that's how you would normally see them written. And C binds with G and A binds with T. You can see that here, how that works out. And we basically look at the order of the C's, G's, A's, and T's 
And we can assume that for a lot of different organisms, the order in a lot of these DNA sequences is unique to that organism. There's conserved regions of DNA where, where every sort of every moth would have the same, the same sequence of DNA, but you end up with species specific regions of DNA and that might be due to mutation or some other factor. And we can actually use those differences in the DNA between these different types of moths to actually say what they are and to identify them. So that's what molecular diagnostics really is, is identifying a specimen based on a unique sequences, a unique sequence of nucleotides. And we can use this DNA for species identification um, in a variety of different cases. So we can use DNA identification more, when morphology is questionable or ambiguous. So the morphology doesn't actually work in some cases. Um, as I said, um, well, I mean, it, it can depend on the situation, but a lot of, a lot of different species of moths uh, look very similar and their morphology is very similar. And so we can use DNA to separate them in some cases. Associate immatures with identified adults. As I said before, uh, larvae of different pest species often look very similar. And so we need to actually use DNA to identify those to species in, in some cases. Eggs and pupae are even more difficult to identify um, without using something like DNA. We can associate males with females in sexually dimorphic species. You run into this in the tropics a lot where you'll have a male that looks quite different from the female and you don't really know if they're the same species or not because there's a lot of other um, taxa in that group and so you can use DNA to actually say that this male is associated with this female and then we use DNA of course in phylogenetics and reconstructing evolutionary history um, with phylogenetic trees um, and so that's even a different you know part of, of molecular diagnostics that we really won't talk about today, but uh, certainly very useful and, and the most common um, method of, of doing phylogenetics today. So types of diagnostics include uh, DNA barcoding. Um, that's what we're going to talk about today. That's probably the most basic method of using uh, DNA to identify something. So we're using a standard segment of DNA for species identification. In this case, uh, for animals, it is a 658 base pair region of CO1. So cytochrome oxidase 1 is the gene, and we're talking about in the mitochondria here. Um, we'll talk about why that's important here in a second. We abbreviate cytochrome C oxidase 1 as CO1, so I'm going to just say CO1 from here on out. Um, the reason for using this this region for DNA barcodes in animals is simply from a paper back in 2003 where they just tried this method out and it worked pretty good and that's been the standard ever since. And so there's a, a large database of CL1 DNA barcodes that you can reference. You can also do more species specific assays or specialized assays and this is really what we do when we're identifying pest species for the USDA. Um, this is what we develop in my lab, our species-specific assays. Um, these use different types of technologies like real-time PCR, digital PCR, um, next generation sequencing, a lot of other things that are way more complicated than just sequencing um, DNA barcodes. But we don't really have time to talk about that today, but we do have a lot of species-specific assays that will rapidly identify something like um, Tuta Absoluta, for instance. We have a species-specific real-time assay for that and are working on a digital assay for that right now. Um, the advantage of doing a lot of these species-specific assays is that these are often more rapid than doing uh, some sort of DNA barcoding because in most cases you need to actually have the DNA sequence in order to compare the barcodes. So you actually need to send off the PCR product for sequencing. Whereas with um, real-time PCR, digital PCR, we can do that all in-house and we don't need to send away for sequencing products. Um, and so it just makes it a lot more rapid in order to get your answer. We can get an answer uh, on an identification using real-time PCR in a few hours versus maybe a couple days for DNA barcoding. And then there's also a lot of genomics and complete genome sequencing happening right now. This is the new, the new it's not even that new now, it's been happening for many years, but 
this is where the new technologies are developed. Um, pretty much every every few months, there's some new technology that comes out, and this is really where we get to the point. At some point, we'll be, you know sequencing the complete genome of every specimen that we capture. Um, right now that's cost prohibitive, but within you know a few years, that sort of thing will be happening. And so the technology evolves really rapidly, but something that we always go back to is DNA barcoding. Because even though this technology, again, I said the, the paper that used this method of, uh, that identified this region of DNA was from 2003, but the method for doing this goes back to the early 90s or even before that. And so it's really, at this point, an ancient method of using DNA to identify something, but it still works quite well and it's qu still quite valuable. So mitochondrial DNA is generally what we use for DNA barcodes in animals at least. And the reason for that is because it is a circular molecule. This is just a, uh, a map here of the complete mitochondrial genome for uh, this tortricid pest, Grapholeta molesta. The reason that this is good is because it's, being a circular molecule like this, it's more stable. It doesn't break down as rapidly. And so we can get DNA barcodes out of specimens that are 100 years old, for instance, and we can't do that for nuclear DNA. Um, it's also much easier to sequence because being in the mitochondria, there's many, many, many copies compared to the nuclear DNA. And so we can get, we can amplify these, these copies a lot easier than we would be able to with nuclear DNA because there just are so many copies of it. Um, the mitochondrial genome is about 15,000 base pairs in Lepidoptera. And again, the region that we're going to look at for DNA barcoding is CO1. So it's this region right here. This is just a uh, a cartoon version of what CO1 might look like here. Again, it's this region right here in the mitochondrial genome. And so if we stretch it out here, it's about 1.5 or 1500 bases long. Um, the barcode region that we use to identify a lot of these things is right here. Uh, it's about 650 bases long. And so that's the region that we're looking at when we're talking about DNA barcoding in animals and especially in, in Lepidoptera. So the, the idea behind this is really quite simple. We take expertly identified specimens, we sequence them, we enter those into a database. And so that's now our reference database. We take some unknown specimens, and in this case, these are larvae. We sequence those, we compare them to the reference database, and we get some sort of answer. So the idea here is really quite simple. We just are having, we have a reference barcode database that represents these specimens that were expertly identified using probably morphology. And then we're gonna compare those with these unknowns and we end up with some sort of matching score usually. So this might be 100% match to one of these specimens and therefore I could tell you what, that, what this thing actually is based on the DNA. The advantage of doing DNA barcoding versus other methods of uh, identification using DNA right now is this database. It's called the Barcode of Life Data Systems Database, or BOLD is the abbreviation. Um, this is the website for it. It is the largest database of DNA barcodes. As you can see here, there's a lot. So over 8 million specimens with barcodes representing 315,000 species. There's no other reference in the world of DNA data like this. So even if we have complete genome sequences of different things, we don't have as much information as is included in this database because it simply covers so many different taxa. And so what we can do is for just simple DNA barcoding is submit an unknown sequence to this identification engine and then see what our results look like. So in my example here, this would be the bull database. And so this database has been built using identified specimens, and then we're just gonna query this database to see what our result might look like. So this is just a really brief diagram, I'll be done here in a second, so we can continue on with the other presentations of what this process looks like. And so this is the forward and reverse read of a DNA sequence as we would get it back from the sequencer. So you can see each of these peaks here represent a base or a nucleotide. 
So we have the A's and T's and G's and C's. Um, in this case, they're different colors as well, so we can easily see what those look like. And we take the reverse, the forward sequence um, and the reverse sequence, and we line them together just to make sure there's not any um, problems there with the reads, because sometimes you'll encounter some really um, questionable reads, or sometimes you'll encounter polymorphisms where you actually have you know, an A down here and a T up here. And so you have to account for those as well. But basically you get what you would consider to be your best consensus sequence from your DNA sequencing. And then you simply paste it into bold. This is the, the screenshot off of the, the website. Um, it's currently referencing for this query here, it's referencing the species level Barker records, which are about 4 million sequences and 222,000 species. And so I paste in, this is my sequence, my final consensus sequence from these, this data up here. And I hit go and I end up with a result. In this case, it's the tomato penworm, the, the one that's not Tuta absoluta, but looks just like it um, and is found in a lot of Tuta traps. So in this case, I have a 100% match for this sequence to the reference sequences of Kefiria in, in the bold database. Interpreting these results is not quite as simple as I'm, I'm stating here, but we don't have time to go into that. Um, but you have to sort of know what you're doing to interpret these results. So it's not quite as simple as I'm making it, uh, making it sound here. But this is the general process. You end up sequencing the DNA barcode region, you query the database and you get a result. And in a lot of cases, we can get some results that we're quite confident in. And in, in this case, I would have no problem identifying this D DNA sequence as this species. And I think that is the end. So if we have any questions on that, I can answer those and then we can get back to uh, the other presentations. Thank you so much, uh, Todd. That was excellent. I really appreciate uh, your presentation. Do we have questions? Okay, well, again, if you, if you think of anything, I'll be around and, of course, available via email. And uh, if you have any questions about um, working with DNA or if you think you might be doing that in your, in your laboratory or need to identify something using DNA, just let me know and we can, we can help you out with that. It's great. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Todd. Enjoy the information. Our next speaker is uh, Renita Sawarson, and she's going to talk to us about the tomato leaf miner regional surveillance tracking and response protocols. Hi, and good morning, everyone. I do apologize for not having my video on first and foremost, but I am working from home and my internet is a lot slower at home than at the office. So sorry about that. First up, um, I would have give my, given my introductions already. So most of you all know me. So um, just to a quick note, um, the USDA APHIS IS office in Trinidad, most of you again may know this, but we have a very unique role and opportunity in the Caribbean region where my office is actually the Secretariat for the Caribbean Planter Directors Forum. And that is why I am presenting on the CPHD's backdrop. And really what this means as the Secretariat for the CPHD, we are involved in the daily as well as long-term more strategic planning, development, conceptualizing, execution, and monitoring and control for several uh, regional safeguarding initiatives, particularly those that are funded by the USDA and GCSI. And I have included in my presentation very quickly a slide on the CPHD forum for those of you who may not be quite familiar with that, but I will not spend a lot of time on that. But I really wanted to say that because everything that I'm about to share in my presentation with you today would have been developed in collaboration with the Caribbean Plantel Directors members. And it would have been decisions and actions that would have been adopted or ratified at our, um, by the, the CPHD governing body by our, at our annual CPHD meeting. I just really wanted to highlight that because that shows the level of coordination that's taking place in the region, particularly with respect to our priority pests. So I was asked to walk you all through today the surveillance protocol that has been developed for the Caribbean region for Tuta Absoluta, as well as to point you to the emergency response plan that would have been developed for the Caribbean region for Tuta. 
Um, please remember that all of the information that I'm sharing here today and making mention of in my presentation is included in your AFIS box. Um, today is the last day of the workshop and really this is your opportunity to let us know all those countries that have not received that AFIS box that would have been sent via DHL. I believe I saw one person in the chat indicating that they, they, have, they have not received the box. That would be Guyana. So please, any other countries that or participants that have not received that box, let myself or Dr. Lawrence know so that we could put things in place to follow up on that. Great. So as was mentioned in the previous presentation, the intention of this workshop is not only to build your capacity with respect to Tutor Absoluta, but also to build your capacity and your competency with respect to conducting surveillance and initiating your surveillance program for Tutor Absoluta in your respective countries. Um, many of you may have been exposed or would have attended many of our other USDA regional pest identification workshops that we would have conducted in the region over the last couple of years. We would have um, done uh, other insect orders such as Coleoptera, Tysonoptera, Hemiptera, and even Lepidoptera. And most recently, we would have revisited the OWB with Dr. Gilligan actually in Trinidad. So you'll be very familiar with this approach where we do include a surveillance comp a component to our pest identification workshops. This is really to help close that learning cycle and really um, help participants to solidify and uh, solidify the information and implement the information that they would have learned at this workshop. But this surveillance action, I must say, I must take a minute to say this, is really of significant importance to us in the region and of critical urgency because of the recent detection of Tutor Absoluta a little closer to home, um, it being detected in Haiti. So we would really like to get these, this particular action uh, achieved. So as promised, I included a slide here on the CPHD forum, but I will not be spending a lot of time on it. I could speak all day about the CPHD forum, but really in the quickest of nutshells and easiest of ways that I could explain this, um, the CPHD is a network, a technical network actually, comprising of plant health specialists and technical experts and representatives from 32 member countries. These member countries make up countries that belong to CARICOM, if you're familiar with the, 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 the geopolitical structure in the Caribbean region, as well as the CARICOM associate member states and those overseas territories, the French, British, and Dutch overseas territories that still exist in the Caribbean region, as well as membership from our regional and international plant health organizations such as CABI, CARICOM, CAFSA, FAO, ICA, and of course, USDA. Our universities, which University of Florida is a member of the CPHD, University of the West Indies, et cetera, as well as all our reference labs. And what we do, we come together and through our work and decisions and recommendations, we develop and share technical information on pests and disease detection, exclusion, and management <clears throat> with the aim of safeguarding Caribbean agriculture. Most recently, the CPHD has been recognized as well as the technical advisory body to CAFSA, that's the RPPO in the Caribbean region. And that we are actually that organization or that body that really are the boots on the ground to get the work done, the engine that gets the work done. And if you'd like to learn more about CPHD, particularly look at uh, some of our achievements over the last 10 years, um, I could, you all could please visit the CPHD website at cphdforum.org and I could always share that link with you all later as well. So getting back to the program, why I'm here and what I'm here to do, which is to talk about surveillance. Um, and I included this slide because I think it's a good reminder for us um, of how important surveillance is. Sometimes we get caught up in our daily activities and we really forget the real reason or the bigger picture why we conduct surveillance. And we conduct surveillance primarily for quarantine pests. And these are pests that are not known to be present in our country. And if it does enter, can cause significant economic um, losses as well as biodiversity losses. And so we conduct, as I mentioned, surveillance for these quarantine pests to determine its absence or presence. And if it's absent, good for us. We take action to prevent it. And if it is actually present, we can also take actions to prevent its spread. 
Surveillance is also a very important part for us in fulfilling our country's obligations under, our, under the WTO SPS agreement, to which all our countries are signatories too. It helps with respect to update, updating our pest lists and being transparent and conducting in safe trade. And I just wanted to point your attention to the last, to the bottom of your screen, to two resources that would have been developed by the CPHD forum that can be useful to you as Pantel technicians and even as you conduct this exercise that you're about to do. It is the CPHD surveillance manual, then the link is available on the slide and can be shared separately, as well as the CPHD National Pest List Manual. So I really encourage you all, um, those of you who are not uh, members of the CPHD website, please join and make yourselves avail to these uh, resources developed by the CPHD. So getting into the regional surveillance protocol, by no way did we want to really reinvent the wheel. It didn't make sense to do that. So what we did was look back at past work that we would have done as well as existing protocols and documents out there. So as mentioned before, we would have conducted um, pest identification, a regional pest identification workshop on Lepidoptera, the, the Lepidoptera order. It was actually hosted by, or should I say facilitated by a former University of um, Florida alumni, Dr. Delano Lewis, his name almost slipped me there. And at that workshop, the pest of importance that was selected was Tutor Absoluta. And he did in fact develop a reconnaissance survey from or on Tutor Absoluta for that workshop. So we looked at that document as well as the NAPO surveillance protocol for tomato leaf miner. And we consolidated these two documents and created and came up with the approach for the surveillance protocol for the Caribbean region. So getting into the elements of the, the protocol, obviously the type of surveillance we're being, we are conducting is a detection survey, because as far as we understand, um, TUTA is not present in the Caribbean region for the exception right now of Haiti. The target life stage that we're looking at is of course the adult tutor because we are doing trapping using pheromone laws. Target crops, of course, solanaceous crops, the major host or the major host plant for tutor absoluta is tomatoes. Research has actually shown that there are some other minor solanaceous crops that could be host targets as well, which are eggplants and peppers as well as some solanaceous weeds, but our big focus crop is tomatoes. Obviously that leads us to our target areas. Um, Dr. Hodges, I do apologize, but if there's anything in the chat, I can't see, it just prompts me on the screen. So if you need me to stop, you'll need to let me know. No, there's nothing of, of importance. Uh, Julieta was just mentioning that we miss uh, Delana Lewis in uh, Florida, in Gainesville. So. Oh, okay. Okay. Sorry, because I can't, I can't open the chat. So just to note that. Thank you. Um, so our target areas are, of course, vegetable farms and nurseries. Now, there are some other target areas that were mentioned and listed in the NAPO protocol, which um, include ports of entry, uh, border crossings, and these remain still viable um, areas, target areas for us, because we need to remember that, in fact, we are conducting a detection survey and as mentioned before we need to when detect when doing a detection survey we need to pay attention particular mind of the pathway that the pest can enter and in 2019 we again benefited from GCSI to update our Caribbean pathway analysis particularly for tutor absoluta and three top pathways for very high likely or high entry um, possibility for entry of Tuta Absoluta in the Caribbean region remains the human movement pathway. And we're all familiar with um, pa passengers actually being traveling with agricultural material on them, as well as through trade and being hitchhiking pests and propagative materials. So the ports of entries, border crossings, all remain viable sites for trapping, especially as you continue your surveillance activities beyond the um, beyond the lifetime or the life cycle of this workshop as you really continue monitoring your borders. 
So with respect to timing and duration, if you're setting up your traps in a solanaceous uh, field, it's for, and most likely a tomato production site, you keep your traps there as long as the, the tomato field is in production. If you're looking to put your traps out in alternative areas such as packing houses or storing facilities, you put your traps out there as long as the product is available. With respect to tools and apparatus, we've been talking about this in several presentations and making mention to you of all the materials that APHIS would have sent. So you should have received complete trap sets. You would have gotten your Delta traps, your yellow sticky cards, baskets, hangers, your laws, GPS units. Um, some of you may say that you don't have this, but just want to point you to um, the fact that APHIS would have in other um capacity building activities most likely under fruit fly uh, surveillance activity we would have supplied most countries in the caribbean region with gps units so go ask your plant health director if you don't have access to it ask your plant health director in your country for the use of that we also well we would not have supplied digital cameras but what we would have supplied was usb dino light microscopes which are excellent for uh, taking your pictures and uploading them as well. Gloves, plastic bags, and forceps, all things you should have. With respect to the surveillance period, we expect that the surveillance should be conducted in this first phase for a period of three months. We would have supplied with the resources that we had enough trapping material to last each of the countries participating here today in initiating a surveillance program for three months. Very important to note your traps need to be serviced every two weeks. Your, your yellow sticky liner should be removed every two weeks and replaced ex and examined, of course, and your data collected. Your laws, however, should be replaced every four weeks or once per month. So basically in one month, you should have removed your yellow sticky liners twice and replaced your law once. And we have just heard from uh, Dr. Gilligan and we would have heard it again from uh, Jim about data collection and he suggested, and you all would really be familiar with this, given the amount of surveillance work that you would be doing nationally, as well as those other regional surveillance activities, particularly with respect to fruit flies that you would be engaged in and the importance and the need to collect data. So you must give your trap and identification number or code. The suggested one was just TA2 to, to absolute to zero 01, just a, as a, a point of reference or an example. Again, you should have all of your traps geocoded. So you should have GPS coordinates for your traps. You should also have a proper description of where you set the traps up. Some persons even have a small drawing and this is done um, particularly when you have your fruit fly trapping cards, you all do a small drawing just to describe where it is and, um, and its location. You should have the name of the facility and the land or the land owner where you are setting up these traps, the date the trap was placed as well as what activity you are going to do or you have done when you visit the trap. Are you servicing the trap? Are you replacing the attractant? If you even replace the trap because something is missing. And of course, recording your findings as you go. So with respect to sample sites, now with respect to this, we are aware that there is a disparity in the size of countries that make up the Caribbean region. Some are large, some are very small. So what we did was break these countries into these two categories, larger countries and smaller countries and supplied um, different sets or different amounts of materials to each of these countries. And we'll be asking them to target based on your size, different amounts of sites. So with respect to large countries, and let me just explain the abbreviations here, TA, that's Trinidad and Tobago, Jamaica, Guyana, Suriname, Bahamas, because of the quantity of islands we're looking at, and Belize, you are all in the large um, country category. We are asking you to obviously um, set traps in all of your major solanaceous areas or areas where solanaceous crops are grown. You should ideally select 10 agricultural zones and within those zones, you set four traps in one acre area and you repeat that trapping density in your 10, in your 10 specific or distinct areas or zones. For the smaller countries, these are all the other countries that are not listed obviously on the previous slide. 
And here we will ask you to select five agricultural zones or five distinct areas. And I just used Trinidad and Tobago because, um, well, that's the country I'm from, but just as pictorial examples on the side there. So you all have to select five agricultural zones and set four traps in a one acre area and repeat that trapping density in your five agricultural zones. Now, I know some of you might kind of, um, you know, you might be focusing on the trapping density. You might be thinking it's a, a bit dense or thick in one area. Um, I'll explain to you why there are two real reasons why we, we, we have it that dense. The first reason is based on the traditional size or the general size of the production areas or farms in many of the islands. And we wanted to make sure that it was standardized throughout the protocol. As well as the second reason, and perhaps the most obvious, I think is because of the impact of COVID-19 and its restrictions on our ability to move around as easily as we would like. So we didn't want to, um, you know, make it unmanageable. We wanted to make it as manageable as possible. Um, and obviously not to do anything to impact on anyone's health as best as possible. With respect to uh, placement of your trap, you would have understand from the biology of Tuta Absoluta, they don't fly very high and they prefer to hang out on the young shoots of the solanaceous crops. So you should ideally place your trap as close as possible to the canopy of the crop, usually about one to two feet just above the, the, the line, the canopy. And as you continue to go to um, service these traps, and as the crop continues to grow, you can obviously adjust your trap to the appropriate height as the crop grows. Uh, as Dr. Gilligan would have just said in his presentation, we encourage, we highly encourage field observation. So as you go in the field to service your traps, continue to scout around, look for any uh, look for any damage, look for any signs or symptoms. And if you'd like, you could collect these things and read them out. Just pay particular attention to your biosecurity uh, uh, capabilities in your labs. And collecting these things doesn't mean that you necessarily have tutor, but you're collecting them to read them out so you could refine your skills and identification as well. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this slide because Julieta covered this so well in her presentation yesterday. And I swear if I had seen this presentation by Julieta sooner, I would not have been so um, probably intimidated by Tuta Absoluta trapping and, and looking at um, the yellow sticky traps. Um, she covered this excellently yesterday in her presentation titled How to Screen and Identify Tuta. She explained um, what you, well, first of all, she explained that you may obviously encounter non targets. So you might find Kaipera or Sinui in your traps, but she showed you how to look at color, wing shape, and other morphological cues that can help you quickly determine or rule out suspect against sus, uh, suspect. Um, samples and of course how you go about removing those samples with your histoclear and examining and dissecting. So with respect to preliminary reporting, we are going to be reaching out to the participants for a second um, time and perhaps a third time. We do have a second session, please um, December, card it for December 3rd to follow up with you all. And you should have ideally been, hopefully, and I have in a slide coming further down, just some ideas of the schedule, some time frames that we could look at. Um, you should have, after the end of this workshop and with the materials supplied, at least be trapping for about six weeks, which brings us away to about halfway through the expected three months of trapping. So we would like to hear from you and really get some feedback of how your trapping experience has gone, what has um, worked well for you, what hasn't worked. Maybe some countries might actually be placing some traps at ports of entries, at border crossings. What constraints you have faced, what lessons you have learned, and if you are having any difficulties. How we plan to coordinate this feedback uh, with you all is through um, a questionnaire or survey that the CPHD secretary at my office will distribute to all of the participants that are present here today via either Google Form or SurveyMonkey. So 
we're asking you all to please look out for that by at least December. First, continuously check your emails, look for updates from this workshop, and please, please fill out the information in this survey. Now, <clears throat> with respect to the emergency response plans, so you've been trained in tutor, tutor absolute identification, and now you would be in a position to now conduct your surveillance activity. So what do you do if you, and we really don't want this, get a positive identification? Well, the CPHD, through funding from the GCSI, as well as uh, technical support from many of our regional plant health agencies, such as CABI, CADI, uh, AFIS, uh, AFIS, and um, AICA, and CAFSA would have put together a national emergency plan for the Caribbean countries for Tuta Absuta. Um, the plan actually goes through and provide very comprehensive information on the pest biology. So all of the things you would have covered here during this training, pest identification as well, as well as pest damage. It contains all of the information as well on surveillance, monitoring information, and of course, information on the management of the emergency response itself. How do we manage the actions to be undertaken in the event of an incursion? This is an excellent resource and it is available in your boxes, um, as well as on the CPHD website. And again, on this link that is on this slide. As I mentioned, it's a really excellent resource because it would have consulted and sensitized a wide body of knowledge um, on tutor absolute, particularly the USD new pest response guideline. And it would have been expertly adapted to the Caribbean region. Actually, this was also one of our only emergency plans. Last year, we managed um, under the GCSI to complete two emergency response plans for pests of priority, mutual priority to, to the Caribbean and the US. And the Tutor Absoluta was one was that one emergency response plan that we were able to conduct a tabletop exercise for and actually refine the document. So it's been tried and tested, updated, well researched. So we ask you all to please make use of this plan, look at it, read it through, even while preparing or doing your uh, prior to doing your surveillance, you could make use of this document. So getting started with respect to materials, we've been talking about this over and over. And again, just remind those who have not received your APHIS box to let us know. I'm not gonna go through this because this was covered by Sarah in her opening um, presentation, but just to point you to um, the baskets. We included baskets in the trap sets because ideally, uh, and much of the presentations show the law lying on the sticky liner. We had the options to purchase baskets where you don't actually have to put the law directly on the sticky liner, but put it in the basket so it's easier for when you service the traps or you go to visit the traps, it's, it's suspended above. So to make things a little easier and to you know, just be clear as possible and provide as much clarity with respect to dates, schedules, all of the things that we have planned in our mind as a secretariat, um, ideally, we are looking at, well, today is the last day of the ID training. So that's a great achievement there. But we expect that you would probably need about one week, and we aim at the week of 12 to the 16 to really plan, rationalize, put things in place, decide, you know, go through the materials you would have received, decide about staffing, decide about the, the areas that you're going to be placing your traps, just rationalize and get all those things cleared up then we ideally assume and hope that your trapping and surveillance um, could really start by Monday the 19th of October. Then you have to service your trap every two weeks. So your first servicing where you remove your yellow sticky trap liner and you examine and you collect your data should happen around the 2nd of October, sorry, the 2nd of November. Then every two weeks again we follow, so the 16th and the 30th. And we expect to hear from you and get your feedback, get your thoughts on the entire process so far, which would have been about six weeks by December 1st. So this slide is just really to provide some dates and schedules for you just for clarity's sake. You might be wondering, you know, when we wanted certain things or proposed for certain things to happen, that's what this slide provides. And obviously we're going to be 
back here again in a virtual session on December 3rd with University of Florida and other regional partners. So um, just to put some contact information, if you don't already have it, this is my email address and my telephone number, best contact for WhatsApp. If you have any problems with respect to your trapping, you have any questions or you need to follow up on anything, this is my contact information. And uh, thank you. And this is just a picture of the CPHD meeting in Cayman Islands a few years ago, just to share that with you all. Thank you. Thank you, Anita. That was an excellent presentation. We really appreciate your support and guidance through the timeline and everything that uh, we're going through. I think that was extremely helpful. I particularly found your comment about the field survey, looking at the larvae, extremely useful. I actually had the chance to see Tuta absoluta in Ecuador, and, and it's a big difference in terms of how it's infected mm -hmm. plants versus um, what some of the other things you're seeing. So the more the participants get out there and really become familiar with what's common, and not um, not um, and, so, and things that are not too good, because we hope they're not. Yes. Good. It will be a lot easier. So I thought that was a, a really great point. Um, and, and also Matthew's point about using your cell phone as well as your fitness watch can also do the same with respect to GPS. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't personally have a fitness watch, but thanks. <laughs> and those were very, very excellent points. Do we have questions from the participants? All right, hearing uh, no questions, it could be that, uh, that we'll have additional questions and comments later. But... All right. Okay, R Rishi, please go ahead. Um, with regards to setting up the traps at the ports, right? Since we don't have, we would not have plants there. What's the suggestion of where we put in them? Hi, hi, Rishi. Um, I will have to perhaps probably do a little more research on that, but I'll venture to say um, where, uh, you know, there's high traffic of uh, people moving in and um, closest to, um, you know, like the trees and areas close by, um, just on the outskirts, Rishi. Well, it will be similar to the fruit fly traps. Fruit fly, yeah. I was trying oh. to, I, I wanted to tell you that actually, okay. Okay. just like how um, you all have it in Trinidad already. Okay, no problem. Thanks. Great question. Uh, Renita, I also had a question. For uh -huh. the, it was about the, are the, the panels you're using yellow and not white in these traps? I believe it's actually white. Yes, it's white. Yeah. Uh, Renita, are we adding killing agent to those delta traps that are going out in the field or just as they are? Just as they are. No killing agent there. Oh, okay. Because they're sticky? It's not Ex yeah, because they're sticky and they will not be able, as Todd, um, indicated on in his previous presentation they work best for micro lepidoptera so they they will actually die on the sticky trap because they can't get out a great question matthew do you have a question yeah i was just thinking if um so uh, fresh produce trade tends to be perishable and so the cayman islands i guess would come quite quickly through off the plane through a warehouse being air freighted in due to its perishability. So it would seem logical with a distance of six meters from Todd's, from Todd's presentation to perhaps place one of these in the warehouse handling the, the fresh produce um, potentially, do you, do you agree? Hey, this, is, this is Todd. Um, we do that in other ports in the US um, where we have people handling um, commodities that are coming in from from shipments, we actually do have some traps in the uh, in those areas. So if you have an extra trap and have time to do that, it might not be a bad idea. Do you get do, do, do they provide much information? Do you get much caught on them or not really? We usually don't get much, but there's always the chance that something escapes from a shipment like that. And so 
we have traps set up like that in these warehouses to um, to basically account for something like that. And, and sometimes there are things that are found um, not necessarily on, on fruits and that a whole lot, but on something like cut flowers and things. Uh, those are often, um, there's sort of what we call hitchhikers that are adults that are coming in on those shipments that are captured in traps like that. Um, but certainly it's, it's a place to look um, and uh, it definitely can't hurt if you have the ability to do that. Yeah, I'm not entirely sure where um, the tomatoes and other Selenaceous products are, are potentially moving through and, and came and they may well um, be expedited straight to the uh, commercial premises. It's a great question. Good discussion. So it looks like uh, Renita is trying to reconnect. Um, and so we just lost Renita. Does anybody have any additional questions? Vanessa, yes, please. In Dominica, we've conducted the surveillance already. What I found is I would get a lot of um, deaths, lizards, and, and, and other die in the traps. But what I would do would, we would not have them suspended from a stick or anything over the canopy. Sometimes I would have them within, hooked within the trees. So is that a method that I should not um, employ and I should maybe put them on a stick instead over the canopy? You know, I think it's probably fine for it to be within as well. Um, I, I think the point that Renita was making is really that, that closeness to the crop, which it sounds like you're, ve you're very close to the, the crop with the trap and with the, the live population that I've seen in the field before, you know, I can also confirm, I think probably the closer you can get to the, I don't know if, if Todd or um, Jim or would like to comment further on that. Yeah, I think you're right. I think closer to the crop is better. Um, the reason that we recommend not, I think what you're referring to is not hanging pheromone traps in within the, the canopy of, of, of a plant or something along, along those lines is because it disrupts the pheromone plume that, that is given off by the trap. And so it might not be quite as effective, but certainly if you have it close to the, uh, the, the crops, and especially with something like Tuda, that might not actually fly very far. I think that's probably, probably good. Um, if you can just get it close there, either on a pole or actually on, in, within the plants themselves there. Um, from what I've seen too to in the field, um, definitely you would get, if you put some traps up near a tomato plant, it really wouldn't matter where you put them, you would get some moths in the traps. And so I think that's probably good. Oh, just to echo and to repeat what Todd said, yeah, it's good to hang the uh, traps near the crops. Some moths just do not fly very far from the, the host plant. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so that, that, that's a really good point. Hopefully you're not in really heavily infested field, fields, but it's, it's true that if you probably, no matter where you put the trap near the tomato, if your field is truly infested, you know, you're probably going to get moths. This is a, a comment that Juliana provided as well. Um, but, but you really want to also have that visual survey going and, and just try to understand what's happening with any of the Lepidoptera pests um, that are already on your tomatoes. I would recommend that. Hi, Amanda. Claire, please. I don't, I don't know how well you can hear me. We can hear you. Um, so just, I'm just, one of my concerns is that we may not have tomato crops growing at this time. Hang on, let me turn this down. And um, I'm, so my options are probably going to be warehouses, ports of entry, uh, compost, and stuff like that. Is, does that have value, as much value as obviously, um, I, I would imagine it's going to be less value than having it actually in the crop. Yeah, that's my thinking, but, but you're right. We don't even have that many tomatoes. Really in Florida, spring is really more of our tomato season versus fall. Uh, Todd, what do you think about, I, I guess you've had the most like port experience. Well, I think there's value there in doing that. And it just, 
if even if you don't find anything demonstrating that it's not there, of course. Um, I think that for a lot of these pests in the Caribbean, we're not quite sure of their actual distribution. And so um, I think any survey data we can get at this point would be would be valuable. Hey, this is Jim. To, um, if you know any uh, wild crops or alternative hosts, potential host plants in the Solanaceae that like weeds, um, you could hang a trap or two in the in near that near those plants. We also have another question, um, and the question is: Are you going to get another supply of Histoclear? I uh, know we don't have plans to send another supply of Histoclear at this time. We could send you information on potentially where you could order it, but uh, in terms of other alternatives, um, Jim and uh, and others, are there other alternatives uh, besides Histoclear? But well, besides rather xylene, which is carcinogenic. Well, first you you can reuse Histoclear quite a bit. Um, it's not like you have to use it once and throw it away. You can, it gets quite dirty if you're using a lot of sticky traps, but I, I, I wasn't here for the sticky trap instructions, but if you, if you cut out a small piece of sticky trap with the moth on it and soak that in the Histoclear and then reuse the Histoclear, you can reuse it quite a bit. I mean, maybe 20 times before it gets just too dirty to reuse. And so if you run out of Histoclear, any citrus oil is, is simply what Histoclear is. So there's other citrus oils that are available. They might not be quite as effective as Histoclear in removing the really sticky stickum, uh, but those, they'll definitely be better than, than trying some other method. And xylene is, is not something you really wanna deal with. So I think any, any other sort of citrus oil if you run out of Histoclear, um, but you can reuse it quite a bit. There's also a group on. Hemo D, of course, we talked, Julieta talked about how Hemo D was more, you know, toxic, but it's available. Uh, but yeah, I think those are all good points. Question was also raised, are we going to receive pheromone lures for the survey? The pheromone lures are in the packet from the Trinidad office with Renita, the USDA packet. So you should have received both a University of Florida packet and a USDA packet. And, um, and yeah, it's also, Juliet also mentioned that it's Todd indicated citrus oils and you can actually uh, buy citrus oils, uh, just they sell them to different citrus oils to homeowners for removing pine sap. And um, so that's another thought. Um, and Janet wanted to mention to everyone, uh, Dr. Lawrence is mentioning in the emergency response plan, the ERP for to the absolute, there is a table with the host plants, and this might be good when you're thinking about looking for those things other than to, other than tomato for your survey that we're, that we're about to start. So that that's an excellent point. Thank you, Janet. And so, other questions? Okay. Well, this is great, Jim. I'd like you to, um, if you can, Jim Hayden, maybe you could share a slide of. Um, of uh, the tomato pinworm or as we're thinking about this tomato pinworm we're about to go to our our breakout groups um, briefly we, we don't have as much time because we will need to get back to the rest of our presentations but um, Jim maybe you could show us a slide of really thinking about these uh, micro lepidoptera dissections and get everyone back in the mindset of this remember we're using the tomato pinworm as an example because we didn't have you know, two to absoluta to send out, um, and you will likely get a number of the tomato pinworms potentially in your traps. So please, um, um, and I think Julieta also wants to show a few slides. So Jim, do you have like a, a slide that you wanted to show perhaps of, of uh, to kind of help us get started? Uh, hi, um, well, not, I mean, I have various slides I can show. Um, I have the junk on my desk here. Um, I might suggest that we take a break for five minutes. Um, people might want to get up and stretch their legs. I certainly would like to. Um, let me share a screen here. Uh, would you like to say something else? 
And I think this is good. I think this is um, this is a good reminder for us to kind of now that we're going to go back in the breakout room. So instead of doing a break right now in the main room, we're going to let you do your breaks at the beginning in your breakout rooms, just so that we, we can kind of get people to the breakout room. And so um, this is this is great. This is basically what you should kind of have on your desk when you're um, getting ready for thinking about these micro lepidoptera. Um, Jim, would you like to say anything about um, how you normally get started with this? Um, you mean like dissection? Um, perhaps, um, yes. I mean, just, just anything generally, yeah, with the dissection. Well, let me show my slides. Yeah, why don't Julieta show slides? Because um, basically what you do is you take the abdomen off and drop it in KOH. That's how I, that's how I start. Mm -hmm. All right, and now we're going to go to Julieta. Thank you, Jim. Just trying to jump start everyone to the, the breakout. Thank you, Julieta. These are the five slides I would like to show just as a reminder of what we were doing yesterday. Mm -hmm. So if you already have your specimens soaked in KOH, they're ready to go. So the step number one is to transfer them to a glass dish with alcohol or water. Have your curved forceps ready and a brush. I saw some of you using brushes with long, long um, fibers. I would recommend cutting them like I was taught during various trainings trips that I took. And that helps a lot for removing the scales from the abdomen and from the valve. At the bottom, you'll see a specimen that has been cleaned, simply cleaned from scales, and you already can see a lot of details. My, the second slide I'd like to show you is to remind you that it is very good to brush them clean and keep cleaning the fluid in your dish. And you'll be able to uh, do that with the brush or with the back of the curved forceps. Um, the two steps to remove the genitalia is one, to push them partially out by pressing on the abdomen. And you finish it by grabbing the genitalia as valves, gently pulling until they separate from the abdomen. Once the genitalia are out, if they are sitos, if they have hair, CD, you can use the same brush or curb tip forceps to clean them. Not completely if necessary, but at least partially so that you can start looking at the structures that you need to see. You can see on the left, as an example on Helicoverpesia, pretty clean sample already very easy to examine. And notice that I have flattened it, even if it's just by pure pressure. Just keep flattening so you can see the structures easily. And even if a specimen as small as Caeferia, you can try to remove the adiegus or the phallus so you can examine it separately from the rest of the genitalia. And this is the last slide to show you. This is what you're going to see in the specimen you're dissecting today. Although on this slide, all the parts are separated. I'm going to show you the slide. Um, no, this is the best slide I have. Um, all these parts will be available for your review and I want you to notice three characters when you're ready to examine your specimens. The valve, long curve, it looks like a hand with a thumb. Look at the oncus. This is a long, narrow structure with a tip. This structure is normally in the middle. So, so you will see these two parts together. And the last character I want you to look for it's called the vinculum, and it is elongated or narrow. This is not the same on every species. This is specifically for Caeferia. These three characters will help you identify uh, successfully Caeferia like a Persicella, the tomato pinworm. And that's all I need to say. Any questions? It's wonderful. Thank you so much, um, Julieta. That was. Uh... I think just what we needed to 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 jumpstart us.
it it um, it does look like um, we're ready now to I'm going to go ahead and open up the breakouts. We have some content that we need to return to. So the breakout is going to be a little bit more rapid and short this time. We're going to actually uh, return at 1115 just to make sure we can finish on time. <clears throat> but, um, you know, if we have time at the end, you, you can return to your breakout if you would like to do that, if we do have extra time at the end. Uh, but we do, uh, I, I will encourage you to also take at the beginning of your breakout, that's what I'd also like you to take if you need like a five minute break to get your coffee or a stand up and stretch or whatever you need to do, I would encourage you to take that then. Um, so yes, so we're going to return. It's gonna be pretty quick. Um, we, we may extend it to 1120 on our return if it looks like people need it, but we do need to get back to the rest of the content. Thank you so much. So you should get your breakout invitation now. Welcome back. I know that was a little bit fast, uh, but hopefully you did get something out of it. Uh, would anybody like to, to share anything from their group, things to think about? Let's maybe start with Andy. How did everything go in your group, group one? It was really good. They didn't have enough time to dissect the, the pinworm, but they, they're going to uh, work on it after the, the presentations. Mm -hmm. That sounds good. Um, group two, um, Gideon and, and Jim and that group, how did that go? It went well. The, those of us who were able to dissect it were, um, mm -hmm. were able to show something, had, uh, had did, good, did, did good dissections. The, Leaving the, the tails in KOH overnight enabled the, us to see the valvi and uh, and the uncus, the diagnostic characters. I mean, they're they're messy, you know. They just need to be brushed off. There's a lot of fat, but the, the important thing is to see the the characters. So it was good, I'd say. Wonderful. What about group three? Um, 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 Hi, Amanda. This is Julieta. Uh, my group did really well, and I was able to give them some hints and shortcuts, and um, they all appreciated it. So I enjoyed very much my group three. And, and Sarah, how did everything go in group four? A little, a little more quiet today, but um, I had a couple of folks uh, give me a little feedback. Um, we had one member of the group um, successfully get the um, genitalia out of the uh, moth body and identify the structures. Um, and we also just kind of um, had a reminder of how important it is to have those curved forceps um, along with a pair of straight forceps um, for the uh, removal of the genitalia. And so with that, um, Corey, can you go ahead and in with your um, brief presentation about the work that you're doing, and then we're going to go into the CPDN presentation, which is a little bit, uh, I think we'll need a little bit more time for that one. So if you could go ahead and pull up your screen, that would be great. Okay. Well, thank you for having me. So I'm going to give a real quick presentation about a project we are in the process of developing out of the PPQ Miami lab. Um, when I heard that this workshop was happening, um, I realized it was a great opportunity to reach out to members of the Caribbean plant protection community um, because it's something that could really use some collaborators. So I've been talking to Dennis Martin about this for a few months now and it worked out perfectly. So here we are. Um, quick about me, I'm based out of Miami at the Chapman Field Lab. Um, it's a pretty interesting place to conduct research. It's co-located with the ARS lab in the USDA and it's where we have a lot of the germplasm for the tropical fruit plants that we grow in South Florida. Um, and it's a, it's a beautiful place to work. A lot of peacocks and tropical fruit, but I'm talking to people that live on, in paradise. So uh, maybe it's not a fair comparison. I'm talking about the Caribbean pathway. And as we all know, pests move through the Caribbean uh, pretty regularly. This is something that's been well-documented. One example here is Cactoblastis cactorum, um, cactus moth, which is kind of been known to island hopped um, either naturally or through human spread, shipment of, of cactus pads or plants, um, and also 
potentially through weather events. There's been some recent research on hurricanes causing reintroductions of this pest. Another one you may know about is uh, black cicatoka. You see the bananas that spread through the Caribbean, uh, probably through weather events as well. And then there's fruit flies. You know, the Caribbean fruit fly, for instance, is widespread in Florida, uh, such that people assume it's endemic to this area or native at least, but in reality, it, it's also has spread through the Caribbean beyond its original distribution. Um, there's been estimates that around 130 arthropod species in the greater Caribbean basin are present that are pests that have not established in Florida. And in Florida, about 70% of the pests that arrived in the 70s and 80s came as migrants from neighbor, neighboring territories. So it's just well documented that this is a, an ongoing issue and there's a lot of efforts. Obviously the, the Caribbean Plant Health Directors Forum is a, a great venue and a great effort to get ahead of this problem. Another one, some of you may be familiar with is the Don't Pack a Pest program, which is essentially an outreach program to convince travelers not to move fruits, vegetables, parrots, snails, plants across borders. So the question that I guess I'm, I'm posing here essentially is, will these pests we're dealing with, examples are Tuta absoluta, Helicoverba majora, Maruca vitrata, et cetera, will these be moving through the Caribbean on host material as larva? For instance, people sending shipments of tomatoes between countries where you have an infested tomato or will this occur through natural dispersal, um, either migratory or non-migratory? And when I say migratory versus non-migratory, it basically just mean, you know, migratory is a, a program genetic response or it's directed flight. It's uh, purposeful in a way, whereas non-migratory can include pests that are out foraging and essentially get caught up in the wind current or just in their foraging activities dispersed across a wide distance. And there's evidence that this is occurring in the Caribbean. For instance, a really interesting study was done on offshore oil platforms in the Gulf of Mexico. These are you know, hundreds of miles off the coast. And they found a wide diversity of insects, not just things that we know to be migratory, like moths, you know, big noctuids, or even butterflies, but even smaller things, beetles, um, stink bugs, thrips, all sorts of, of different orders were collected on these platforms. There's also been genetic evidence that fall armyworm uh, in Puerto Rico and probably other places in that area have moved northward um, into Florida, essentially migratory movement, um, all the way up into the East Coast as well, where they mix with the genes of populations from uh, Southern Texas and Mexico. And then recent work uh, showing also that cactus moth is being reintroduced into areas um, this is based on genetic evidence, and that this is correlated with uh, weather events such as hurricanes and tropical systems. So this is a, a well-documented phenomenon, and it's important to, to think about because if we're primarily dealing with a pathway that is through natural dispersal, well, the best response is increased trapping and monitoring effort, something that is you know, being promoted in this workshop and through the works of the Caribbean plant health directors and the other one would be human mediated dispersal, which would require pathway intervention. So this is something that in some ways is, I, I wouldn't say easier, but it, it's, it's, a, it's a single point source. You're able to go directly to the port of entry and conduct inspections or even the port of induction. So on, on this kind of safeguarding continuum, you know, you have these various steps where you can put intervention and natural dispersal somewhat bypasses all these steps, uh, going right from the, the neighboring territory into the place of detection. So the project we're looking to conduct in 2021, this is still a proposal that's being worked out, the, the details of, is essentially using pollen to mark the insects to determine um, their movement throughout the region. And this is a, not a new idea. Um, so a few recent examples here. Um, it's been used to monitor migrations of Helicoverpa, Armesura, and Petidra in Australia. Um, the corny or Heliothis or Heliocarpazea has been a classic example. This is really interesting. In southern Texas and Mexico, where there's citrus growing, um, the, the Heliocarpazea interact with the citrus pollen. And then trapping up in northern United States, this is the Midwest where they grow a lot of corn and soybean, 
you, they would capture these corn earworms and they would find they had citrus pollen on them and there's no citrus up in the, the Midwest. And so this was a, a direct a form of further evidence that they're migratory, that these adults interact with the plant as an adult in Texas and Mexico, and then as adults were migratory northward where they uh, began the infestation of agriculture in the Midwest. And then in, the, in Europe, they've also tracked the butterfly species crossing the Mediterranean on migratory flights. And then there's the classic example of the monarch butterflies um, that we all know about. Of course, those we don't treat as pests because we don't grow milkweed commercially. So the method we're proposing here is, is pretty straightforward. If the detection is made, um, you have to raise the question, you know, was this a pest that had been introduced and been reproducing in the area, or was this a natural migrant that that, or a vagrant that occurred. There's two ways to look at this uh, for the pollen. You could do traditional pollenology, which means looking at the pollen grains in their microscope. The problem with that is you're limited usually to uh, a, a genus level identification. Um, it's very hard to get down to a species level and it requires uh, a great deal of expertise. Whereas molecular ID, uh, it's not easy. I'm not an expert by any means, but it, there's a lot more people in the world that are experts with using molecular techniques than there are with conventional pillinology. Either of these methods will give you an ID of the associated plant. And there's really two possibilities here. Either that plant is found near where you capture the pest, or it's not found near where you capture the pest. And those two possibilities have different interpretations. If it's found in the region of capture, well, then we know at least that the pest has an association with this plant, with the host. Um, it's either occurring in the area where that plant's been found, possibly you know, using it as a, a source of, of nectar. And you could then use this to judge the, the guide your delimiting survey or other responses. The more interesting scenario, the one that you know, would be relevant to what I'm hoping to look into is if the plant is not found in the region of capture. Because that would tell you that the plant uh, likely occurred where that plant is found, or the pest would occurred where the plant is found. And so if that plant was found in a distant area and not locally, you could make an assumption that there was some uh, spread long distance to get the, the pest where you are now. And that would mean that you would want to focus on this natural migration pathway. Um, there's a couple other benefits. I mentioned that you, know, you could then use this to determine how important is the process of natural dispersal for invasion within the region. And you know, this is useful because it will help tell you that you need to include increase your surveillance outside of ports of entry, and that regional cooperation is crucial because these are things that are going to move around whether or not you let them, <laughs> whether you like it or not. Um, then there's also just, I think, in interesting, con interesting implications for biodiversity. You know, these are species which can island hop. You're spreading not just the, the insect species, you're also spreading the pollen, which is pl plant genetic information. So you might have movement of, of genotypes of plants throughout the region. Similarly, uh, pest biotypes. You know, I'm talking here about Lepidoptera primarily. So an example might be the, ca the cabbage looper, which there's been evidence of resistance in some populations, which you know, those genes could be moved uh, with, the, with the pest. Even though we already have cabbage looper throughout the area, um, we don't necessarily have the same distribution of resistance genes. So it's not just a species level where this natural dispersal uh, may have an impact on agriculture. So for 2021, um, hoping in Florida to collect moth specimens from marginal coastal areas. This picture is Dry Tortugas uh, National Park and just off, offshore of Key West. Actually, it's about 80 miles away from Key West. So it's kind of a, an island in the middle of, of the ocean. Um, and it's a really great place to collect migrants or vagrants that are moving across the sea um, because there's a, not a whole lot of plant life to sustain native populations and the, the species that are present are, are pretty well documented. Um, and also this project is kind of a massive conspiracy just to try to get a trip to this place. Um, so once the, the moth specimen is collected, you then would inspect it for pollen grains. And then if it has pollen grains, hit up the pollen metabarcoding, which is maybe easier said than done. Um, but once that's done, you then have a list of plant associations for each specimen. And then you would then look at the range of that plant species, determine if it was 
co-located with the area where you detected the pest. And then from there, you can make inferences about migration or not. That's pretty much how this process would work. One thing that would be really useful for this project is, I use the term outgroup, maybe that's not accurate, but if you have specimens from a wide range of localities within the Caribbean, any moth species, you know, ideally something that's not maybe super locally common and ideally from a marginal habitat, so you're getting things that possibly are, are not uh, endemic. Um, you could use any of those species and it, it's useful to demonstrate the underlying concepts. So, you know, if you had a moth captured in, for an example, Puerto Rico and a moth captured in Florida, and you were looking at the pollen grains, to demonstrate the concept, you would eventually try to find a situation where you had a plant association that could not have occurred in one of the region, in both regions, because of the difference in the plant uh, biogeography. So samples collected this way typically would want to be something that would preserve the specimen and the pollen. One of the issues here is you have commingling of, of samples within a trap, and so you might have you know, contamination essentially of different pollen grains. So ideally it's a situation where you have uh, single specimens captured and isolated and not um, in contact with each other for too long of a period. So malaise traps and bucket traps would be ideal for this, um, something without a, a liquid collection solution um, and ideally without a sticky collection uh, solution. Julieta a while back, I don't know if Julieta remembers this, but she gave me a few bycatch samples of mostly Spidoptera from the Hilo Gaberpa uh, Armigera monitoring. And I, I, I looked under a microscope at about 20 of these and more than half of them had pollen grains adhered to the proboscis and some to their legs. So it was clear here that um, this is occurring, that you're going to have pollen on these specimens. And those were from sticky traps. So, or they might have been from bucket traps too, actually. But either way, um, you can get some information from these in insects from various different trap methods. So what I was hoping to do is, is reach out to the, the safeguarding community in the Caribbean and see if anybody in the audience is interested in this concept that does collect moths um, you know, throughout the year. This is something that will be occurring in 2021 uh, that would be interested in participating, potentially sending in samples where we would then conduct the barcoding um, and try to get an idea of what plants were associated with it, essentially has a proof of concept for this basic idea. And so if you think this is an interesting idea, if it's something that, that you know, perks your curiosity, feel free to shoot me an email. My email address is here at the bottom. Um, and we could you know, try to make something work without some support, possibly with uh, collection materials and supporting the, the cost of shipment of samples and all that. Um, and so I wanted to keep this short. Uh, I think uh, Dr. Hodges for the opportunity to, to use this as a chance to reach out. Um, and yeah, please don't hesitate to send me an email if you um, are interested. And that's it. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Thanks, Corey. I appreciate you talking to us today. Are there any questions from the participants? Doesn't look like we have any questions. Uh, of course, um, you have Corey's information and the information that I sent in your email yesterday. Uh, and uh, I also mentioned I'll be preparing a Teams folder with all the information. And I see some virtual claps. So uh, thank you again, Corey, for your presentation. I would also like to bring, um, yes, yes, you do have this presentation. I just received that que question as well. And uh, as a reminder, um, Sarah and I will be preparing a Microsoft Teams folder with everything in it. So we'll be sending you that um, invitation as well within the next couple of weeks. Uh, I also wanted to bring your attention to the, um, the survey that's been listed in the chat. I could maybe list it again in the chat. I'll also be sending out the post workshop survey in an email. But uh, with that, our next uh, presenter will be um, Deanne Ramroop, and we're um, honored to have her here with us uh, to really talk about the CPDN updates. This is uh, really an important part of what we're doing um, in, in the network. And this is actually a presentation I, I haven't sent you yet. And so I will send that to you in a follow-up message. And, and Deanne, given your tight schedule, it's just such an honor to have you with us 
here today. Thank you for your willingness to talk about the CPBN with us. Okay, thank you and good morning, everyone. Um, indeed, it's a, uh, it's a pleasure to be able to share with you. Um, I will try to share my screen now. Okay, are we, are we seeing the, the screen? Yes, absolutely. And so uh, this is, uh, uh, and Deanne is, as I'm sure she'll tell you, of course, the chairperson of the CPDN. And it's, it's just, we're just so honored and pleased to have you. Thank you for presenting to us today. Okay, thank you very much. Um, thank you, participants. And what I will attempt to do in the presentation, I would go through a, a few slides to give you a, a better understanding of what the Caribbean Pest Diagnostic Network, CPDN, is all about. And following the slide presentations, I'll walk you through quickly through the, actually, the live site with the CPDN. Um, so let's uh, move forward. Um, Dr. Hodges, I'm just checking to see these, these slides are changing on your screen. Indeed they are. It looks very good. Thank you. Great. Okay. So I'll give a bit of the background, the CPDN achievements and the way forward. Um, basically, the Caribbean Pest Diagnostic Network, CPDN, is an internet-based lab information management system. It facilitates the digital upload of samples for rapid diagnosis and pest identification. And these are made online through the interactions between members and the plant protection experts. So the digital images presented are assessed and the result solutions are communicated to uh, persons who would have submitted those samples. The CPDN membership, um, the chair for that, uh, the CPDN is myself, Diane Ramu from Trinidad and Tobago. And we have members from Barbados, Dominican Republic, uh, St. Lucia, Guyana, and Jamaica. So what is the key objective of the CPDN? It's to support an effective regional plant health safeguarding strategy that facilitates plant production and trade in the Caribbean through efficient and effective diagnostics. So this is, this is where the importance is. It provides the opportunity, it provides the, the means by which we can have efficient and effective diagnostics. And this includes rapid identification and confirmation of specimens collected as part of quarantine and or surveillance activities in countries and promotion of open source tools for preliminary identification of field samples. Some, I was just going to highlight uh, some of the major achievements in 2019, 2020 with the CPDN. And this would have been with the signing of a MOU, a Memorandum of Understanding with the Caribbean Plant Health Directors and the University of Florida. And this therefore allows for a number of activities to take place. This slide here shows actually a revised website of the CPDN and this MOU allows us to have actually countries, participants, um, clients from the various countries to submit their samples to the CPDN and at this, um, with this interface, you can have identification. When you uh, upload your samples, you can have these samples identified and then the results communicated back to you. So this here shows the revised CPDN site. You would see um, on the left is the menu with resources, which are also on the website, which consists of a number of um, training material, resource material, how to take photos, what to look for in terms of um, submitting the, the digital photo and a number of other areas. You will see frequently asked questions and actually uh, how to do or the, the, a guide to how to manipulate the particular site. So over the last couple of weeks, what we have been doing is actually testing this revised site and testing in terms of um, what we would have referred to as beta testing. So you, we had um, Cayman Islands, Jamaica, Trinidad, Tobago was involved in the testing of the site meaning it's how it is operating, the functionality, and in collaboration with the University of Florida. So we have completed our process and actually we are now fine tuning in terms of how 
persons will be registered onto the CPDN for actual use. One of the, the great, um, with the MOU, the Memorandum of Understanding, is that we have dedicated persons attached to the University of Florida who will be doing the identification in the areas of plant pathology, entomology, weeds, etc. So this again shows my CPDN. You can actually, when you submit samples, you could go back and check my samples, submit a sample. Of course, there's the information on how to submit a sample. View your most recent samples submitted. If you want to search for samples, a sample distribution map. And again, of course, um, the persons, the specialists who will be doing the identifications. Submitting a sample. So I'm going to go through these slides, but I will take you through the live site. Um, how you submit a sample. For example, if it's insect, you have a drop down menu. The sample data form, which is the information that you would submit when you are submitting your digital sample, which includes the customer name, the address, um, a short name for the sample, uh, where was the sample co collected, if it's the host plant and variety, the pest location, the symptoms, etc. So this is your data form with your sample submission. The list of identifiers. So for example, if it is a plant pathology or entomology, you would select the required um, specialists from the, the drop-down menu. And here you can look at the samples that are sub submitted. You could look at your samples that you would have submitted. Uh, I mentioned the resources training material, which is also available on the site. Your reference materials, which is on the site also, guidelines for submitting plant photos for identification. Details of the samples submitted. So this, this here actually, when you have completed your submission, you can actually go in and see the details of what you would have submitted inclusive of your photos. When your sample has been diagnosed, you will receive email notification indicated that your sample has been examined. And that the diagnosis, it will lead you back to the site, which will show where your, the diagnosis was completed and the details of what was found. So this particular site is, is, is unique, is very user friendly, and it allows for, as mentioned, rapid diagnosis, diagnostics of sample submissions and actually provides the opportunity also for you to have a database of the samples that you would have submitted um, from your various countries, et cetera, and the details of it. All right, this slide shows in terms of CPDN how to um, how to register. How, and so again, this, is, this has been revised to some ex extent and it is ongoing. And this is the opportunity for us to, to increase that capacity to have um, identification of be it pathogens or insect um, pests and to facilitate, for example, um, not just plant quarantine, but our surveillance activities. So again, how to submit samples, frequently asked questions, and of course, a feedback form. So I will take you through a live demonstration, basically to acknowledge this, this, this work has been um, actually a partnership with a number of agencies, USDA, APHIS, of course, Dr. Hodges and the University of Florida, who has championed this particular activity. And of course, the Caribbean Plant Health Directors, the technical working groups, and the members associated with it. So thank you for allowing me to share that with you. And I will go um, straight into the live site. Let me see if I can manipulate. Um. Thank you so much, Dan. That was quite excellent. We appreciate your presentation. Yes. And um, I could probably just go through the live slide, uh, Dr. Hodges, in a few minutes. Yes, I guess while you're working on pulling up the live site, do we have questions from the, the participants? I have to say, I know Deanne and I are quite grateful for all those who have been beta testing. It's certainly been a process, but I think everything is, um, I think it's, it's really coming together. So um, thank, thank you for your extensive work in that, Deanne, and others involved in the testing. While you're pulling up the live site, if I could just bring everyone's attention to the uh, the survey, the Qualtrics survey that I placed, the online survey for this workshop that I placed in the chat. Of course, I will also email that as well as Deanne's presentation. 
and eventually the Teams folder as well to you. So Deanne, here's the live site. Great. So just to give you an insight of what it looks like, um, I would have showed this in the, okay. So you can see I've logged in and here you have my samples, how to submit a sample. So here, if you are submitting a sample, let's say it's insect plant, it's very easy to, to um, so you select next. And this is, this page comes up, you can fill your information, you select and then you submit, all right? So I haven't filled in anything there. So in terms of submitting, but I want to, all, to jump to resources so you can get an insight into uh, what is available on, on the site also. Okay, so if you go, when you go to resources, you will see a, a range of, of um, topics, introduction to the, the, the system guidelines to submit in plant photos, digital photography, sampling for insects, sampling for diseases. So again, it's, it's, it's very, um, a very comprehensive uh, um, package that's available there. So with that, um, you know, once you can, you can log on, you can see, and this is, this is what Dr. Hutchins, in terms of we would now um, actually embark on considering the registration for um, users from the different countries and the guidelines for use. But I think now that we have it up to this, this stage, it will be a work in progress, but at least it is, we are able to submit samples. We have successfully been able to submit the samples and to get um, almost immediate feedback within 24 hours, we have been getting feedback on the samples submitted. So thank you again for this opportunity. And um, if there are any questions, I'll be pleased to attempt to answer the same. Yeah, and I guess while the users are considering their questions, I can also, I have administrative rights. I don't, uh, I don't see the private samples, but I can certainly, you know, see what's going on with the site. And I'm, I'm logging in a couple of times a week just to, to check on how things are going. But if, if the ministries want to let me know who their approved users are, it's, I mean, the approval of new users is a, is a fairly quick process at this point. Okay, just, we yeah. have a question that came up in the chat, Deanne, maybe uh, this was just sent to me, but I'll address it to you. What about others, countries? So we don't have all the countries. It's essentially, there were questions about other countries than the ones that you listed on your initial slide. What about British Virgin Islands, Haiti, uh, Cusao, others, Car Carazo, others that you didn't list? The, the, the countries listed on the slide were those who were members of the technical working group. Um, so it's going to be, the, uh, we will finalize, uh, but it's open to the, the, those other countries. But the countries on the slide was just to show the members of the technical working group, not those who have access. So I think it is more than 32 countries have access. So um, that's what it is. In terms of the users, I think in the, in the um, coming week, we will finalize those and we will engage the, the countries to ensure that they, they register and can start uh, using these, these sites. Yeah, with the MOU, we, we opened it up more broadly. And so that's, it's very, very broad right now. I, I just want to say a special thanks to um, Mr. Lyle Bus and to Dr. Kari Kamen, and to you, um, Dr. Hodges, and all the others for really um, coming together and making this, this, this happen. So thank you all. Well, the, the work that you've done, of course, is, is obviously tremendous. It's just been, been quite a bit uh, coming together for this technical working group. And we appreciate all of the participants, you know, at this workshop with their interest in participating and uh, and supporting all of these collective efforts in, in diagnostics and survey, you know, and with that, if no one has any other questions, you know, I wonder if, if Dr. Lawrence, uh, do you have anything else that you would like to say before we uh, conclude and adjourn the meeting? Yes, thanks a lot, Amanda. Yes, just a just um, brief, very briefly for a minute, because I know that time is of essence. I know the participants will join with me to say congratulations to Dr. Hodges and her team 
for hosting an excellent workshop. Amanda and I started this trek last year, first developing a proposal for this workshop. We thought we were good, said it would be a summer workshop, and we had all these plans, and COVID hit. And so we had to break, so we were like there in headlights and had to regroup and decide how we could move forward. And uh, so I just really want to thank Dr. Hodges for her creativity, for the network that she was able to pull on to bring this together, and for just excellent collaboration. Let me also thank the many expert trainers who shared their knowledge so freely with us. Miss Julieta Brambilla, so practical, just so practical and real. Thank you. Mr. Lyle Buss started us off on the first day with a bang with photography. Excellent tips. Thank you so much. Dr. Todd Gilligan for today. He made the molecular seem so simple, the ABCs. And it was just so well done. Thank you so much. Dr. Jim Hayden, once again, wealth of knowledge, sharing so freely. Thank you. And of course, today we had our guest speaker, Dr. Corey Penka, looking at pollen metabarcoding. Thank you all. It would not have been possible without your inputs and your hard work. Of course, in Amanda's lab, her team has just been tremendous. Dr. Gideon Alake, Ms. Sarah Berkmeyer, Dr. An Mr. Andy Jean-Louis, and of course yesterday, Hannah Talton. These operatives, I have to say they are the, were the background operatives that made it happen. You know, the multiple emails, the multiple meetings, and Thanks so very much. Recognition to Renito for all the logistics from the IS office in Trinidad, and of course for giving her very good presentation today, and for Diane for dropping in. I know Diane's schedule. Um, all of you have just brought everything together. This was an experiment by it in itself, <laughs> and I am very happy that we we took the opportunity to to follow through. And so thanks to the University of Florida team, thanks to APHIS IS, and of course, thanks to the GCSI for supporting this activity. All the funding came from the GCSI for this action. And we acknowledge Mr. Dennis Martin, the director of GCSI. He's sorry he could not be here today for this um, final wrap up, but he had other pressing priorities. So we recognize the GCSI, and of course, the funds from the GCSI comes from the USDA APHIS. And to you, the participants, thank you for registering, thank you for participating, thank you for your enthusiasm. And we look forward to checking in on you again in December, December 3rd. At that time, we will have drinks on the house. So I will look forward to having our Christmas sorrel or whatever it is at that time. So take care, everybody, please keep safe and we will be in touch. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Hodges. Back to you, Amanda. Thank you, Dr. Lawrence. Really, I think that that says it all. Thank you all and everyone stay safe and well. Take care. <laughs>